Okay, so a lot of people have been having some trouble with bacterial reproduction, so I'm going to go back over that and hopefully give you some good examples to help you remember. So binary fission, this is asexual cell division, okay? So this is cloning. It's going to make itself over and over and over again. So if it were me, I would clone myself and there would be two Lorens. And then if I were to do it a bunch of times, it would be a colony of Lorens. All right, so it's the same bacteria cell over and over and over and over again. No change in the genetic material. All right, so bacteria can also sexually reproduce. And by sexually reproduce, I mean they recombine, there's a recombination of their genes. So the genetic material changes. This can be done in one of three ways. So one, two, three. So transformation, uh, this is taking up DNA from another source. Uh, this, a guy named Griffith came up with this. You'll need to know this name, Griffith. So what he did, he had two things of bacteria. One was dead. It was dead bacteria, and it caused disease. Another, a second thing of bacteria was live, healthy. It was good bacteria. He mixed the dead and the live bacteria together, and suddenly his happy, healthy bacteria caused disease. So it picked up pieces of the pathogenic genes from the bacteria, the bad bacteria, and used it. So in class, I talked about... Uh, my clothes, so my clothes will represent pathogenic, or I'm sorry, my clothes will represent my genetic information, and if I go find a jacket on the floor and then I put it on, I've taken that genetic material and added it to my genetic material. Uh, secondly, transduction. This is genes are accidentally transported by a bacteriophage. So after a bacteriophage has put its DNA inside a bacteria cell, so here's the chromosome, and it adds its DNA, so that's our little prophage. Whenever environmental stress activates the viral DNA, it's going to pull itself out of the bacteria, and when it does that, it sometimes takes some of the bacteria's DNA with it to another bacteria cell. So, accidental transport by a bacteriophage. By a bacteriophage. Okay, this is a specific thing that does this. So, conjugation. This is an exchange of genetic information. Um, if you heard about it in class, I had two people come up and they held hands, and that was their sex pillus, and they moved the little stuffed animals, which were their packages of genetic information, they exchanged those across their sex pillus, all right? So on the next slide is an example of this. All right, so here's one bacteria cell, number one, and number two, and here is their sex pillus, okay? So they are going to pass genetic information across this pillus. All right? They're not making a new bacteria cell. They're not making a baby. They are just exchanging genetic information. All right, I think this information should be in the previous slides, and so I'm not going to go back over it too much. Um, it just, it's just saying that archaebacteria and eukarya, so eukaryotes and extremophiles, they evolved together and had a more common ancestor more recently than you bacteria did with either of these. All right, so bacterial importance. This is, or I'm sorry, there are decomposers. So these guys recycle. So they break down dead things, whether it be trees, plants, animals, and they turn organic into inorganic. Next, we have nitrogen fixers. So plants need nitrogen and they cannot pull it right out of the air. So these nitrogen-fixing bacteria pull the nitrogen out of the air and they put it into the soil where the plants can get to it. That's nitrogen fixation. Uh, it's also useful, bacteria is useful in genetic engineering. So those of you that have seen the Bourne Legacy, they talked about that in there. In the Bourne Legacy, they used viruses, but it's the same general concept. Uh, you can use bacteria to take different genes to different places in different organisms. So you can exchange out genes, or you can alter the genes, or just take them out in general. So, Lastly, bioremediation. Uh, this is the use of organisms to remove pollutants from air, soil, and water. So the big oil spill that was a couple of years ago, um, several places used bacteria to eat through that oil and help clean it up a little faster. 
So here's an example of bioremediation. I couldn't find one with bacteria, so this is with a virus, but it's the same general idea. So do you see all the black gunk build up on this, built up on this flask? So this is without the virus. So when they added the virus, the virus ate through all that black gunk, and now it's clean. You see how that works? Very interesting. So bacteria can cause disease. This is our next topic. So most bacteria that cause an illness, they do this by producing a toxin. And it can be an exotoxin or an endotoxin. Exotoxins are proteins that bacterial cells secrete into their environment. So these are proteins, key point, proteins. And these go into their environment. Their environment is us, all right, not just the outside air, water, blah, blah, blah. It's us. We are their environment because they're infecting us. Endotoxins, these are lipid components of the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. So gram-negative stained pink, which means they have less peptidoglycan. And these lipid components are released when the cell dies or is ingested by a defensive cell, so like a white blood cell. White blood cells cruise around our bodies and they eat any bacteria that they find. All right, so you don't need to write any of this slide down. This is just something we talked about in class. So exotoxins are some of the most powerful poisons known. So I'm sure all of you have heard of Staphylococcus aureus. Is one of its exotoxins destroys the white blood cells, which is why there's so much pus in staph infections. Um, you usually will have, you know, a little bit of pus with any sort of illness or any sort of infection. Uh, with Staphylococcus aureus, this bacteria, the exotoxin, actually looks to destroy. So it goes and hunts down white blood cells and kills them. That's why there's so much of it. Now you can also contaminate food with this exotoxin. Less than one one millionth of a gram causes vomiting and diarrhea. So it's extremely toxic. All right, so here is this bacteria. You see it's in clumps. So we're going to call it staph. And the bacteria, they're spherical. So this is coccus. Coxy, remember that? If it were in strips, if it were in a chain, it would be strepto or strep. This is in your notes from earlier. All right, forgot to warn you, this is a slide with lots of blood and guts. If this bothers you, don't pay attention to it. All right, so endotoxins, next one. You, again, you don't need to know this slide, just something we talked about in class. So endotoxins all cause the same general symptoms, uh, fever, aches, and sometimes a dangerous drop in your blood pressure. So an example is Neisseria meningitis. This causes bacterial meningitis, and this illness can kill a person in a couple of hours or days. So this is, it clumps around your brain stem, and it causes you to have a really bad headache, you get a really stiff neck, and then pretty soon uh, you will die. So that's not good. Salmonella, we've all heard of this. It causes food poisoning, but it also causes typhoid fever, so you get typhoid fever from ingesting um, poop particles. So this isn't, you know, grab a spoon, let's eat some poop. This is, it gets into your food or your water supply, and then you get sick. All right, so this is Neisseria meningitis. These little spherical, so coxy bacteria. And then this is salmonella. So this is what builds up on your food, and then you eat it, and then you get sick. Food poisoning. Really gross, nasty stuff. All right. Also, sorry, I forgot to warn you on this one. This is a brain of a person that had bacterial meningitis. You can see this gray bacteria buildup here. Okay, so that's what happened. This is the brain stem, the cerebellum, and then the frontal lobes. So this brain is kind of upside down. All right, this is the bottom of the brain. All right, so here's the really important stuff. You do need to write these down. So Koch's postulates. We use Koch's postulates to prove that a certain bacteria causes a certain disease. All right, so after you already have a hypothesis, let's use staph, for example. So you have the hypothesis that Staphylococcus aureus causes staph infections. You use Koch's postulates to prove that. So step number one, we're going to find the candidate bacterium in every case of the disease. So if these are my little people, and they all have staph infections right here, 
each one of these infections, I should be able to find Staphylococcus aureus bacteria. All right, so number two, you isolate the bacteria you found in those infections and you grow it on a plate. So just like we grew our bacteria in class, you're going to grow this bacteria on a plate. All right, so number three, so we have this bacteria growing on a plate and we are going to inject this bacteria into, you know, some healthy subject. Usually it's an animal, we're gonna go with a mouse. So we put this bacteria in the mouse and this mouse gets the staph infection. All right, so we put the bacteria into, I am not good at drawing, so here's my mouse. And then the mouse gets sick. It doesn't necessarily die, it just gets sick. So once the mouse is sick, we are going to then pull the bacteria. We're gonna isolate it again and grow it on a plate. Once you've done all four of these things, you have proved that that particular bacteria causes that particular disease. The end.